I just thought we'd do the, the briefest of, of, of intros to the whole book, and then we'll have the reading, if that's all right, and then we'll look specifically at chapter 13. So, at uh, one time, you'll, um, we're calling this series... Is this something that needs to stay here? Is that a special yeah, thing? Yeah. yeah. That's fine. I'm going to put that up here. <laughs> I've moved it. I hope that doesn't upset anyone. Um, we've, uh, we've called this little series, Seeing as God Sees. Seeing as God sees. And you'll see that the headings I've given the talks to do with seeing beyond, you know, what, what can we see? If you look around the room this morning, your faith in the Lord Jesus is going to make a difference to what you see. So let, let me explain a little bit what I mean. If a, if a random passerby comes in now, or a member of staff, that guy who was here a few minutes ago, uh, what does he see? A bunch of people um, with maybe not that much in common, waiting for coffee, um, not sure what's going on here. What are these people doing with this random bloke at the front? Um, you, if you look around, you see differently, right? You see brothers and sisters, I hope. You see a family. You're right to see those things. That's what God has made you. And perhaps you also see a team. You see um, some sort of sense of hope for the people of Putney. Because there's a church who knows Jesus and want to, share, want to share Jesus. How might God use this group of people? How might God continue to use this family in the coming months to reach people for Jesus? Faith in God leads us to see things differently. We're going to see a lot of that in 1 Samuel this weekend. We want to see beyond the physical, beyond what we can just see with our own eyes. And in particular, I think, beyond the challenges that life presents. Or we see them, we don't ignore them, and then we try and see with God's eyes. How will faith in the Lord Jesus change how I see those challenges in my life or in this world? Let me give you an example from my life right now. Um, the challenges to ministry in the Church of England, where I'm coming from, are huge. We are in a complete mess. And anyone, because anyone can see that, right? Anyone can see the Church of England is in a state. And we can't see any easy solutions. And look, so far, that is all correct. But is there more? Can God be doing something amidst all of that? Well, yes, of course he can. I've seen two things so far. Uh, one is an extraordinary new sense of unity among evangelicals in the Church of England. Different flavours of evangelicals united in a new way, and it is fantastic. And it's come about because of a huge problem. Another thing that's happened is that we're involved in a project in um, another church, the other side of Enfield, a place called Ponder's End, a very different demographic. We're trying to, the church is closed, we're trying to open it again, us and a couple of other churches. And uh, for various reasons, some money that we thought we were going to get didn't materialise. Well, now, because of everything going on in the Church of England, a bunch of churches that don't want to send their money to the denomination are sending it to us instead uh, to use in Ponder's End. And it's fantastic. That is the sort of way we know God loves to work, right? There are international stories of God doing amazing things when it looks terrible. If we see a massive problem, God says, watch this. See what I can do. Of course, the ultimate example is Jesus. When you see a man executed, crucified, what do you see? What do you think? Instinctively, we see, well, failure, right? Maybe we see injustice, pain, you know, a broken family, we think, and, and so much more. All of that is true, but the eyes of faith show us so much more, right? The Lord is doing something extraordinary. He is mighty to save. He can save through, through that. And I hope we'll see much more of that today and tomorrow. I'm going to dive in in a minute to 1 Samuel 13. Let me just give you some context. Um, if, you, if you want to, turn to the very last bit of the, the book of Judges, the very last sentence in the book of Judges. Judges 21, verse 25. In those days... Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. They did as they saw fit seeing, right? You see with your eyes and you act accordingly. And, and that's it. They're, that's the level we're operating on. Uh, the book of Ruth on the next page opens with a man who, when he sees famine, well, he leaves the land of God's promise. He lives in Bethlehem. And off he goes to, to another land, to Moab. And you go, what's going on there? We're not doing Ruth this weekend. That's what he saw fit. 
Uh, the book of the book of books of Samuel, one book really, one and two Samuel, it opens with a man in chapter one. And the first thing we hear about him is he has two wives. Hmm. That's what he saw fit to do. One, one of his wives couldn't have children, and that's a whole other thing, isn't it? We're not we're not going to get into that today. It's an extraordinary chapter, chapter one of one Samuel. And so, what did he see fit to do? Well, he has another wife. And inevitably, there's huge friction there and all sorts of problems. We're about 1,100 years before Jesus here. And in the opening chapters, we have Hannah, who sees so much more than her eyes show her. Just look at her, her, her prayer in chapter 2. Extraordinary. She speaks prophetically. And then we have Eli, this priest with his, his wicked sons. When he sees Hannah praying in the tabernacle, he doesn't even recognize prayer. That's what he sees. He sees it and he doesn't know it. Uh, there's a lot about leadership here. Lots about leadership. Eli, then Samuel, then Saul, then David in the books of Samuel. Um, but it's about more than leadership. It's about our heart and God's heart. And it's about whether we see as he sees. Chapter 8, if you want to flip to there very, very briefly, you might see that Israel asks for a king. And God says, well, they've asked for a king because they've rejected me. They've rejected the Lord God as king. Uh, but he grants their request. Um, that, but he says, um, you want a king so you can be like all the other nations. You see all those other nations with their kings and you go, I want to be like them. I, I've, I've tried to make you different, Israel. <laughs> you're supposed to be different from all the other nations. But you see them and you want to be like them. So that's why you're asking for a king. And it's going to be terrible, but OK. You can have your king. Um, Chapter 9, we meet Saul. Have a look at chapter 9, verse 2. A son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. That's what you see. He's good looking. He's very tall. Will he be a good king? I mean, he could be, couldn't he? Sounds promising. Well, I'll show you in a moment how he doesn't quite seem to obey the instructions he's given. But then he... There's good stuff too. The Holy Spirit comes on him, chapter 10. In chapter 11, he rescues some of the people of Israel from invaders. Nahash, the Ammonite. Ammonite, you thought was a fossil. It's actually a group of people. <laughs> um, they, they come along and, and, and Saul saves them. That's where we've got to. So, shall we have a Bible reading? That would be good, wouldn't it? Let's do that. Thank you very much. Uh, 1 Samuel 13. And we'll open up that in a second. Thank you. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years over Israel. He chose 3,000 men from Israel for himself. 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash in Bethel's hill country, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gebeah of Benjamin. He sent the rest of the troops away, each to his own tent. Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine garrison, and Israel is now repulsive to the Philistines. Then the troops were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines also gathered to fight against Israel. 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth -Avon. The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. They hid in caves, in thickets, among rocks and in holes and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal and all his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Saul had set. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal and the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him. And Samuel asked, what have you done? Saul answered, when I saw that the troops were deserting me and you didn't come within the appointed days and the Philistines were gathering a mishmash, 
I thought, the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal, and I haven't sought the Lord's favour, so I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, Ye have been foolish. Ye have not kept the command of the Lord your God um, gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel, but now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Then Saul went from Gilgal to Gebeah in Benjamin. Saul registered the troops who were with him, about 600 men. Saul, his son Jonathan, and the troops who were with them were staying in Geba of Benjamin, and the Philistines were capped, camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went from the Philistine camp in three divisions. One division headed towards the Oprah Road, leading to the land of Shual. The next division headed toward the Beth Horan Road, and the last division headed down the border road that looks out over the Zeboim Valley towards the wilderness. No blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all the Israelites went to the Philistines to sharpen their ploughs, mattocks, axes and sickles. The price was two thirds of a shekel for ploughs and mattocks and one third of a shekel for pitchforks and axes and for putting a point on a cattle prod. So on the day after the battle, not a sword or spear could be found in the hand of any of the troops who were with Saul and Jonathan. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had weapons. Thank you very much. Do keep that open, would you? Shall we pray? Lord God, our Father, we pray that you would speak. I've broken your microphone. I'm not going to touch it anymore. Father, please speak and make us listen. Uh, please help us to, uh, to hear your word, to know what you're saying. And by your Holy Spirit in our hearts, would you help us to respond as you direct us? Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It was not a premeditated, organized party. He was, in a sense, ambushed with a cake. We've got a, we've got a cake at some point. Have we got a, have we got, there we go. Very important. It was not a premeditated organised party. He was, in a sense, ambushed with a cake. So said Connor Burns MP, trying to stick up for his boss, one of our recent prime ministers, I forget, um, a couple of years ago. Ambushed with a cake. As excuses go, it probably doesn't sound the best, does it? Though in this case, I don't know, maybe, 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 maybe you have some sympathy. Maybe he was just working alone and others turned up with a cake and he just stayed for 10 minutes. Either way, it was, some, it was part of something much bigger. The excuse didn't fly very well. And arguably it was the beginning of Boris Johnson's downfall. We can do much better than that, can't we? We can break the rules. And often we can do a pretty good job, at least of convincing ourselves that, that we're the exception or, or our, our circumstances are exceptional or the rules just weren't fair. If only you could see what I see, you'd understand why I had to do whatever it was. That's the way we've acted since the days of Adam and Eve. God gives a command. We break it. But, you know, it wasn't our fault. We shouldn't take the blame. Do you recognize that in yourself at all? Uh, perhaps there's something we know we, we really ought to do or really ought not to do. But basically, it's just too hard. And so the excuses come all too readily. We see something of that here in, in 1 Samuel 13. Uh, as King Saul is confronted by Samuel the prophet. There are lessons for us all here. Uh, these events took place 3,000 years ago or so. Uh, but this was written down for us. It's spoken by God. So as I say, keep it open. And um, the way Saul has been introduced to us in the last few chapters, we're beginning to have some doubts about him. In fact, we were from the word go, really. We're not sure. He's definitely not all bad. Supervillain, no. But 
we're just not quite sure he's all good either. And back in chapter 10, after he was anointed as king, he was given a couple of instructions. We'll turn there in a second. Um, a, Philistine, a Philistine outpost was mentioned. So these invaders are in the land. And if you just look very, very briefly at chapter 10, verse 7, you'll see Samuel says at the end of chapter 10, verse 7, do whatever your hand finds to do. Do whatever your hand finds to do. It seems to be a not especially subtle instruction to deal with the Philistines. Uh, a very similar instruction, identical actually, was given in the book of Judges. Uh, this is why you have a king. You want a leader who's going to keep you safe. Uh, he, will, he will drive out the armies who are here to do you harm, right? Uh, so first instruction, we think, uh, deal with the Philistine outpost. And then straight away, the second instruction comes, chapter 10, verse 8. Go down ahead of me, Samuel says, to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Deal with the Philistines, then go to Gilgal and wait seven days. Those instructions seem to be very much in the background to our chapter. I, I, chapter 13, I say seem to be, because that was maybe quite a while ago now. And it's possible that similar commands have been given uh, since then. You, you might have noticed um, that the numbers in, at the beginning of our chapter, verse 1, there are some real, real difficulties with the numbers, all sorts of footnotes where they go, it might be that number, it might be the other number. Um, I don't think we need to trouble ourselves. It doesn't make a huge difference to our understanding, but it's fair to say the exact timings are up for debate here. I'm not completely sure. But let's see what happens. Verses 1 to 4, back in chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, we set the scene. Uh, there's a bit of manoeuvring, a bit of attacking that leads us to this moment of Saul's disobedience. So verse 2, 3,000 men join Saul's army. He's in a place, this place called Michmash, Michmash with 2,000. We meet Jonathan for the first time in this book. Uh, he is at Gibeah, Saul's hometown, with the other 1,000. And verse 3, it's Jonathan who attacks the Philistines. Now, they've, they've, they've moved from where they were a few chapters ago. He attacks them at this place called Geba in Benjamin. In fact, let's have a map. I'm sure you can all see completely clearly what we're doing there. There's a, <laughs> that, that's the land. We'll zoom in a bit. Um, you know, the red dots are sort of the places we're talking about. Uh, Michmash on the right-hand side. We call that east, don't we, traditionally? There's Gibeah, and in the middle is where, is where Geba is. If I go back a step, the, the Philistine cities are on the west southwest a bit and they've come into the land but that's enough of that um he attacks the philistines at geba jonathan does all the indicators are that he does a good job a thorough job he's done what his father should have done he has removed the philistines from the land but of course all of this is a prelude to war so verse three the trumpet sounds everyone is to hear verse four they do hear all israel hears the news saul gets the credit of course verse uh, sorry, it's in that verse, verse 4. And the news is that Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines, literally a stink to the Philistines. We've attacked them. We've killed goodness knows how many. We've rid the land of them. And the rest of them in their cities, not so very far away. Well, they're not going to be very happy about that, are they? End of verse 4. The people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. And we wait. Do you see what's happened already? It looks as if Saul is doing those two things he was told to do in chapter 10. Okay, he got Jonathan, his son, to do some of it, but now he is on his way to Gilgal, probably over in the east, and he's going to wait those seven days. It's going to be a tense wait, isn't it? The Philistines are coming. They're getting ready. As each day goes by, he knows they're gathering, they're planning their attack, but he won't do anything just yet. He'll do as he's told. Got to wait those seven days. So he's got to wait for Samuel. Just imagine him. He comes out of his tent each morning. Any, any news of the Philistines? Yeah. Anyone seen Samuel yet? No, not yet. Six days to go, five days to go. Getting a bit tense. We're waiting. Verses five to eight. Saul is presented with a whole load of reasons not to wait, not to do as he's told. Have a look at verse five for reason number one. 
<laughs> the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000, possibly 30,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. I love it that our author doesn't just tell us, you know, there was a large army or, you know, Bible words, there is an exceedingly large army. No, um, it doesn't even just say too many to count. No, that we get this almost poetic statement, hardly military terminology, that the soldiers of Philist of, from Philistine were as, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Oh, beautiful, except it's an invading army. That's how they felt to Saul and his army sitting waiting. Soldiers like sand on the seashore. And did you spot that they are now at Michmash, where Saul has just come from? Well, as if that wasn't bad enough, the situation gets much worse in verse 6. Because the Israelites who have gathered, they can all see what's going on. And lots of, they, lots of them panic. What do they see? Well, they see disaster. That's what makes them panic. Verse 6, they hid they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some even crossed the Jordan. They took drastic measures to be as far away as they could be from the action. Even those who stay, end of verse 7, are quaking with fear. And at the end of verse 8, Saul's men, Saul's men began to scatter. Perhaps these are his closest allies, his most formidable troops. They are scattering. So, on the one hand, you've got a huge Philistine army assembling. On the other hand, Saul's army diminishing. And he waits. The final reason he might choose not to wait comes in verse 8. He waited for seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. The seventh morning comes. You know, how many more men have we lost today? What news of the Philistines? Yeah, yeah, like sand on the seashore. Has anyone seen Samuel? Lunchtime comes, no Samuel. Perhaps the sun begins to set. Samuel's not here. What do I do? Maybe Saul is going back over the conversations in his head. He, he did say seven days, didn't he? Have I got it wrong? Surely I have to do something here can't just sit here and accept defeat he, he knows what he's supposed to do or better what he's not supposed to do not to do but he's bombarded with reasons to do something and he does verse 9 he bites the bullet verse 9 bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings what did the people around him the people who are left what did they think did they, did they breathe a sigh of relief? Finally, he's doing something, this king of ours. Or did they gulp because they, they remembered what Samuel had said? Well, we don't know. But we're told Saul offered up the burnt offering. He knows he's not supposed to do that. But these are exceptional circumstances. And the king has to act in the best interest of his people, doesn't he? Well, inevitably, just as he finishes doing this thing that he wasn't supposed to do, at least the first offering in verse 10, well, look who turns up. It's still the seventh day. Samuel has come as he said he would. Of course he has. And, and just, yeah, Saul goes out to, to greet him. Oh, Samuel, thank goodness you're here. I'm so pleased to see you, Samuel. You wouldn't believe what has been going on around here the last few days. It's been awful. Let me tell you all about it. And Samuel asks, verse 11, what have you done? What have you done? I think if you're Saul, you're a little bit cheesed off at that question, aren't you? To say the least. What do you mean, what have I done? <laughs> here's what I've done, and here's why. In fact, I'm going to give you three reasons, verse 11. Number, reason number one, the men were scattering, Samuel. They've gone because I was waiting so long. Reason number two, you didn't come at the set time. Where were you? I needed you here. The people who show up are the ones who make the decisions. Reason number three, have you noticed the Philistines assemb uh, assembling just over there in the hills, like the sand on the seashore? Guess what, verse 12, I, I want to honor God. I want to know God's favor. And you weren't here to help Samuel. So what have I done? I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. I forced myself to do it, he says. I took a stand. I 
acted courageously. I've acted heroically here, Samuel. I exercised leadership as God's anointed king. That's what I've done. Verse 13. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You're a fool. How do you react to that? Who do you find, who do you find yourself rooting for here, Saul or Samuel? I think probably the way this is written, we, we've been led to this position of feeling a lot of sympathy for Saul, don't we? He acted according to what he saw, to his real life circumstances, and sure he compromised, but who wouldn't have done the same in his position? Hard to make a call sometimes. I mean, leadership is tricky. I'm sure we're, we're led to feel that way for a purpose because so often that is our attitude too, isn't it? We try our best, but we give in because obedience just feels too hard. It feels unrealistic. And then God shows us our error. He was never unreasonable. He was never unrealistic. What we need is faith that leads to obedience. Twice, twice Samuel says to Saul, you haven't kept the Lord's command. 